Welcome. I'm Kevin Scott, one of the story architects of Star Wars The High Republic. This is Dominic Pace, who plays Gekko the Bounty Hunter from The Mandalorian. Hi, I'm Claudia Gray. I write Star Wars books. And you're listening. And you are listening to Star Wars Comics in Canon. The Force is strong with this one. <laughs> Hello there and welcome to Star Wars Comics in Canon, your guide to the wider Star Wars canon through the comic book lens. And to take you on this journey, I'm your host, Mike Burton. And so brings episode 107. So my friends, this week I am tackling the first volume of the Han Solo and Chewbacca comics by Mark Guggenheim. So if you haven't joined us before, in brief, my show is going through the comics, giving you bullet point plot details of each of the issues, and along the way talking about the various connections to other pieces of Star Wars content in the canon. For example, if species or characters or planets pop up that we've seen somewhere else, usually I will mention where else you've seen them and why they may or may not be significant. I will add here that because I've been doing this show for two and a half years, there's quite a lot of planets and species that I've already tackled numerous times. So I'm not going to tackle every single species and every single planet every single time mainly ones that are relevant or important or that i haven't tackled in a little while but with that aside let's delve into things so first of all let me give you some of the information around this comic so there are going to be 10 issues of han solo and chewbacca issue number 10 is probably going to be released around february march 2023 so it's going to be about six months before i tackle the second volume however issue number one was released march 9th 2022 issue five was released august 10th 2022 and the trade paperback collection of those five is due to be released november 8th 2022 The writer for the whole series is Mark Guggenheim, the artist for these first five issues is David Messina, and the colour artist for these five issues is Alex Sinclair. These collection of stories is Han Solo and Chewbacca Volume 1 called The Crystal Run. That's the name of the story arc and the trade paperback collection. Now, this story is set after Solo, a Star Wars story, but before A New Hope. It seems to be a couple years after Solo and a couple years before A New Hope. So it's set around eight years before the Battle of Yavin, up to around two years before the Battle of Yavin, because the Battle of Yavin was obviously the Death Star blowing up in A New Hope. So that's the external way to kind of use a timeline in Star Wars. But that's the general timings and things and the people involved. And obviously Han Solo and Chewbacca have had many other pieces of content together. Most recently I tackled the Life Day special and episode 83 is all about that. That was released December 2021 as a sort of holiday special. And along the way I'll be telling you more content that Han and Chewie appear in and certain characters that are relevant. I will also say that for Crimson Rain 3, which is a comic in itself, but I also tackle them in batches on this show... If you haven't read that and you intend on reading it and you don't want any spoilers at all, I will warn you there's going to be a few spoilers going down the line just because there's a certain character that unexpectedly pops up and it is directly relating to Crimson Rain number three. Now, if you haven't picked up the comics Crimson Rain number three, then go back and listen to episode 106 of Star Wars Comics and Canon because I tackle the full information there, as well as I've also tackled all of the War of the Bounty Hunters comics and the crossovers. So that's like 34 issues, plus all of the Crimson Rain comics. I'm almost there. I think I'm doing the fourth batch next week or the week after, and then the fifth batch subsequently. And then I'll have tackled all the Crimson Rain and all the War of the Bounty Hunters comics and all of the connected crossover comics as well. So make sure you check those out if you haven't already. There is a play list on my youtube channel where you can find all of those things but with that all in mind let's delve into the comic specifically so let's start off with the crawl of han solo and chewbacca it is a golden age of criminal enterprise with the evil galactic empire preoccupied with bringing the galaxy under its thumb scoundrels and thieves are free to ply their criminal trades with abandon For the past several years, Han Solo and Chewbacca the Wookiee have been scamming, smuggling and thieving for the vile gangster Jabba the Hutt. Business has been good, but Han and Chewbacca are always looking ahead on the next job and the payday that will score them more wealth than they can imagine. So issue one starts with Han and Chewie in the Millennium Falcon. Han is calmed by someone called Kel Tanner after they pulled a job where they stole from a casino and Han and Chewie are meant to go pick them up but they had some issues with the Falcon that Chewie has just finished so they're heading there right now. The Falcon soon appears at the agreed rendezvous and collects Kel and her crew from this rooftop in a casino district. Kel is understandably mad at Han Solo 
but they can't really argue too much because they are now being pursued by the casino security in a few ships and things. So Han flies the Falcon through the city, evading the oncoming ships, and then decides to fly through the storage part of a casino cruiser, thinking that nothing is going to be in it. So he flies the ship straight through it, causing a lot of damage, and then when he's out the other side, flies out of the atmosphere, and then jumps to light speed, and heads to Tatooine. So they land and go into Jabba's palace and speak to Jabba, who thanks Han and Chewie for their hard work, and Kel's crew are pretty annoyed about that because they're like, well, we did all the hard work, Han and Chewie just picked us up and almost killed us. And Han's like, yeah, almost being the key word there. And then Kel warns Han that if their paths cross again, then she may end up shooting him, and then she leaves. I will put it in here that I always say Han, even though I know it's meant to be Han. I'm going to always say Han. Uh, I know that Lando says Han, even though Han says he likes to be called Han, and that's kind of the joke in Solo A Star Wars Story. So I thought I'd address that. I know it's meant to be Han, but I'm going to pronounce it as Han. So Han then wants to have a bit of time off to repair the Falcon and have a breather after that mission. Jabba, however, has a job for him, and although he offers it to Han, Han can't really say no. So the new job is offering 1 million credits. However, this does have to be split with the person who found the job, who is Greedo. So Greedo was introduced in A New Hope. He is the Rodian in which Han Solo does or does not shoot first, depending on which version of the movie that you watch. Greedo has appeared in other Star Wars content as well. He was actually in a deleted scene from The Phantom Menace. He's in the Clone Wars episode Sphere of Influence, and he's in a small handful of comics, including Star Wars 28 in the 2015 run that I tackled in episode 33 of Star Wars Comics in Canon. But he's a fairly minor-ish character considering, you know, he's one of the first characters we see in A New Hope and he gets killed immediately and he's just not a very nice person. And Han does not want to work with Greedo in this comic at all. He knows that he is a backstabber and abandons people and has a reputation for that, whereas Han does not. Jabba basically says, tough, you you have to work with him. And so Han pulls Greedo to one side and says, if you pull anything with me, I'll kill you. He does say, I'll shoot first if you step out of line, which is obviously, as I said, it's a nod to the who shoots first, Han or Greedo. So the job itself is actually trying to obtain an urn that has the ashes of one of Jabba's most hated rivals. So they all agree to help Jabba, and then Jabba confirms that the job is actually on Solo's home planet of Corellia. So Corellia was first seen in live action in Solo, A Star Wars Story. Now I mentioned that Corellia is similar to Earth, and that's because it has one sun. The rotation period, so how long a day is, is 25 standard hours, obviously ours is 24, and then their standard year is 329 days, whereas obviously ours is 365. In addition, the diameter of Corellia is around 11,000 kilometers, and one of the more recent measurements of the diameter of the Earth is around 12 to 13,000 kilometers. So it's all very similar in that regard and it has forests and jungles and oceans and an industrial area so very much like earth and a fun little fact some of the filming on Corellia actually took place in my hometown where I'm living right now I say hometown it's a city called Southampton so parts of Solo A Star Wars Story were filmed within miles of where I'm recording right now And Corellia was actually created in Star Wars Legends. It was actually in the A New Hope novel. So it's always been something that George Lucas has thought about, the origin planet of Han Solo. So it's a very, very old planet. And obviously it being so similar to Earth is probably a little nod to that as well. But back to the story. So on Tatooine, someone else is told of Jabba's job. And that's all we see about that. And then it goes to Corellia. So Han, Greedo and Chewie are in the nice part of town, somewhere called the Pearl District. And it's confirmed that the person who has this urn of this arch rival of Jabba's is someone who is a CEO of CEC, which I think is the Corellian Engineering Corporation. And Han notes that his dad actually used to build YT-1300s for them. Now, YT-1300 is the same ship as the Millennium Falcon. It's a Corellian light freighter. So that's a fun little thing there too. So Han says to Greedo and Chewie that he wants to go into this apartment suite, find the safe that the urn's kept in, and then get the appropriate equipment to break into said safe, and then, you know, use the equipment and get the stuff. So he sees someone leave the apartment building, and it is the owner of the apartment suite. So Han then walks past him in the street, bumps him by accident, in air quotes, and manages to grab his card. So he manages to go into the apartment building with the security card, gets past some security that's being a little bit suspicious of Han, but he manages to talk his way out of it as standard, and then he gets into the room. And it's confirmed that the safe is basically the most impregnable safe in the galaxy. It's made by a company called Lockris, so Han is kind of at a bit of a loss. 
So Han goes to a nearby bar and he bumps into a guy who has an eye patch who actually works for the CEC. Meanwhile, someone called Marshal Buck Vancto pursues and catches a crook. It shows that he's very much an efficient marshal. He's like running around rooftops and things and outmaneuvering this crook that's running away from him. He captures him, sets him out for arrest, and then his next target is Han Solo. And as we near the end of issue number one, it shows that Han is drinking with this old man that he bumped into in this bar. And Han mentions that his dad is called Ovan. And then this old man says, oh my god, I've found you. My name is Ovan, and it shows that Han Solo has seemingly met his own father. So with that in mind, let's move on to issue number two. So issue two starts with a flashback. You've got a young Han Solo being told by his dad, who's drinking quite heavily it seems, that he's meant for better things. His dad was meant to build ships, but Han is meant for more. He's meant to fly them. Then at present day, Han hits Oven in the face. He doesn't believe that it's his dad, so Oven removes his eye patch and shows he's got this wound, like a big scratch thing. Han is still unsure about this, but Oven has a plasma cutter, which Han would need for the safe cracking, so he's a bit torn. So he goes with Chewie and starts to talk to Chewie about it. He still can't decide if Oven is his dad or not, but they'll need to use the plasma cutter, so they'll just kind of go along with it for the time being. So Han, Chewie, Ovan and Greedo all get to this apartment block they visited earlier and it shows that the owner, Mr. Graves, has hired a private security since Han took his passkey and checked out the place before. So Ovan gives Han the plasma cutter and confirms that he wants in and he mentions that Han was meant to fly and says about, oh do you remember when we were here talking about this thing relating to that flashback. Meanwhile, Greedo and Chewie both believe that including Ovan is a bad idea, but Han wants to go with it anyway. So Han and Greedo then break into Locris, and they steal some uniforms from the laundry, and then they leave Locris and head for the apartment. Now, they're let into the apartment because they're wearing the security gear, and they go up to the room, but the room seems to be locked. Greedo says he could slice it, and then he tries, and then says, no, he actually can't slice it. So Han has a smart idea. He calls up Locris, who unlocked the door for him. He basically just says, I can't get in, and pretends the signal's bad and things, and so they just allow it to happen. So they head in, and Greedo is looking at a vase very closely. Then they kind of look around the flat to work out how best to open the safe. While this is happening, you've got Marshal Buck Vankto, who talks to Bib Fortuna. Bib owes him a big favour, so he tells Buck about the job that Han Solo is on, but he says, can you leave the other two with Han to keep doing the job, because we need this done, but you can take Han, it's fine. To clarify, Bib Fortuna is the Twi'lek major dormo of Jabba the Hutt, who you see him in Revenge of the Sith, and he's also in like the post credit scene of Mandalorian Series 2, like the soft, almost trailer for Book of Boba Fett. But back at the apartment, you've got Ovan giving Han a hollow of him and his mum. And then Han retorts and says that he still has the lucky dice he was given and holds them up, which obviously we see in Solo a Star Wars movie quite a lot, confirming that his dad gave them to him. Ovan says that he's trying to get to know Han better. So they do bond a little bit there. Han then uses the plasma cutter, cuts open the safe, but the safe is completely empty. Meanwhile, Chewie is on the street trying to steal them speeders so they can make a quick getaway. Han then comes out and tells Greedo that the safe is empty and then notes Greedo is holding something, basically trying to steal something. It's a small thing, but Han flips it over and sees there is a tracker on it. And before they can do anything else, an alarm sounds and then the security force approach. Han locks the apartment door, but they are stuck and in trouble. So that's where issue two ends, so let's move on to issue number three. So issue three starts with Greedo trying to shoot the window with his blaster, but the bolt just bounces off everything. And then Han has an idea. He calls Locris, asking for medical help on that floor, hoping that they won't talk to the security team that are trying to get into the apartment. When he's questioned on this, Han says, well, this front door is a Locris front door, and the security team haven't contacted the company they work for to get it open. So I assume that the communication at Locris isn't that good. They then wait around and Han goes into the bedroom and finds a terminal. He checks it out and sees something important. It gets revealed at the end of this issue what it is, but I'll just tell you now. He sees where the urn has gone. So some medics do arrive and Han has shot out the window a little bit using the plasma cutter. So the medics arrive and Han tells them that they're in like this other room. They go into this other room and then Han, Greedo and Ovan run to the ship that dropped them off, knock out the pilot and then fly away. They manage to get to Chewie and the speeders fairly quickly and then just zoom away. They're at the spaceport ready to leave and Han confirms to Ovan that the urn seemed to have been sold to someone on Antillion and he asks if Ovan wants to join. Ovan agrees and then they go over to the Falcon and Ovan is completely amazed by the Falcon and says that he's really proud of Han. 
Then he asks where Greedo is, and Han says he told Greedo to get a hydro spanner um, so it could distract him so they could leave without him. And then the Falcon flies away, and you just see Greedo in a market, looking up and seeing the ship that's meant to take him home leave. So then it goes to Antillion. On Antillion, this urn was sold to someone called Madeline Sun. She was a Sava, or Sava, I'm not sure how to pronounce that fully, and she claims not to know about it, this urn, but she seems to know its value, so Han is a little bit suspicious. Now, if you've listened to my episode on Crimson Rain number three, which was episode 106, or if you've read the Crimson Rain comics, then you may recognize the name Madeline Sun. If you don't, this is now going to be spoiler territory to a degree for Crimson Rain, but not really, it's quite a minor detail, is that Madeline Sun, she goes by the name The Archivist, and she's in Crimson Rain number three. The actual issue focuses all around her and her origin story, and the part that we see in this comic, we see her side of it from Crimson Rain. 3. So I would encourage people to, to either listen to my episode on it or pick up the comic or do both. So after Han is told by Madeline that she doesn't have the urn and things, he goes back to Chewie and Ovan and then he has a plan. He tells some nearby stormtroopers that there are some degree of contraband in Madeline's shack. Basically she's like selling things like a junk trader in a sense. So the stormtroopers go in and raid the shack and then there's a bit of noises and things and then someone leaves with Madeline and Han isn't really sure who, doesn't see them properly but it doesn't really care. So Han and Ovan enter the shack. Now what actually happened in there was, and once again this in Crimson Rain 3, is that Kira from Solo A Star Wars Story, Han's old flame, she goes in there, shoots the stormtroopers, saves Madeline, and then wants to use her for Crimson Dawn and their own purposes. So that's what you kind of find out in Crimson Rain 3. But there's way more in Crimson Rain 3, even Yoda's in it, so go check that out. So after Han and Ovan are in the ship, they manage to find the urn, but then the wall behind Ovan blows up and Ovan falls to the floor. Han is then grabbed by a black furry hand, and it shows, as this comic ends, it is Black Chrysanthemum. Now, Black Chrysanthemum now goes by the name of Chrysanthemum primarily in the canon, but he was named that. He was actually introduced in the first issue of the 2015 run of Darth Vader. I believe he was created by Kieran Gillen, and he's appeared in multiple Afro comics, and most notably recently, he appeared in the Book of Boba Fett. So Chrysanthemum is a very powerful and infamous bounty hunter. But if you want to find out more about him, you can check out episode 15 of Star Wars Comics and Canon, that's 1-5, for his introduction in the first volume of the Darth Vader comics I referenced. Or if you want to skip over the Vader stuff, which I wouldn't recommend because they are brilliant comics, but if you want to skip over that and you just want to hear his involvement with Dr. Afra because he's like a main character in the Afro comics, then check out episode 34, for my first volume of the 2016 run of Dr. Afro Comics, which serves as a spiritual successor to the 2015 Darth Vader comics. But with that in mind, let's move on to issue number four. Now, I want to add in here that you actually get to see Chewbacca and Black Chrysanthemum fight in Star Wars issue number 14 from the 2015 run. I tackled that in episode 19 of Star Wars Comics and Canon, so if you want to hear more about that, go check that out. And there's a reason I mentioned that, but we'll get there soon. So this issue for the first half doesn't have almost any dialogue um, because it's all like Chewie, so it's quite fun. So Chewie goes to the shack and spots Ovan KO'd on the floor. He leaves and spots Black Chrysanthemum carrying Han Solo away. He chases after him, shooting his Wookiee Bellcaster, but he doesn't get any direct hits and Black Chrysanthemum gets on a ship and flies away. Chewie does throw a tracker onto the ship and then goes back and picks up Ovan and takes him to the Millennium Falcon. Ovan then wakes up and asks Chewie what's going on and did he pick up the urn and things and Chewie is mad because he wants to follow Black Chrysanthemum. Ovan can't speak Shriwook um, but is somewhat understanding what Chewie is saying and kind of understands that Chewie is tracking Black Chrysanthemum and where Han has gone. So they head to Molo Tanker, which is where they are and before they manage to get out and head off Ovan seems to pass out on the Dejarik table kind of mumbling to himself I thought I was doing better. Chewie kind of manages to get him conscious again, but he's very dazed. He says that he'll be all right in a bit, so Chewie just leaves him with the Falcon. So Chewie enters a base, beats up some guards, and then hears Han being beaten up by Cassantin in front of Mr. Graves, the one who had the urn, the one whose apartment they've broken into twice. Graves is asking where the urn is, and Solo is beaten quite badly. He's bleeding, and he looks a lot worse for wear. Han confirms that the urn is still where they were attacked. He was holding the urn and then Cassantin grabbed him and then he dropped it. And then Chewie enters and Chewie and Cassantin have a Wookiee death duel, which is what Han calls it. 
So they tussle, there's some really, really cool artwork of those two fighting, and that's why I mentioned Star Wars 14, because Cassandra and Chewie have fought before. Uh, this one is equally good, it's a lot of fun, always watching two Wookiees fight, but after a bit of back and forth fighting, Chewie throws a thermal detonator, which does blow up Chrysanthemum. He's still alive and things, obviously, because he appears in Book of Boba Fett, which is set years after Return of the Jedi, whereas this story is set before A New Hope. So Black Chrysanthemum is fine. Chewie then throws the blaster to Han and they start to shoot their way out while Cassantin is somewhat engaged. He was obviously distracted by having a detonator blow up on him. So he managed to shoot their way out, they pass Graves, and they are being chased by Chrysanthemum and the guards, but Han and Chewie do manage to escape, they run over a field, they get to where the Falcon was landed, but the Falcon is no longer there, and that's where issue 4 ends. So my friends, with this we move on to the final issue of the first volume of Han Solo and Chewbacca, issue number 5. So issue 5 starts with Han and Chewie being saved. The person who saves them? Kel Tanner from issue number 1. Once Han is safely on board, she immediately punches him in the face and says that's for stranding me and my crew on Galator 3, which was from issue number one. And she's got a crew with her and you actually get to be introduced to the crew. So the crew are three people we have met before in various places across the canon. The first person is Akko, who is the person I recognise the least. He is from the Age of Rebellion Han Solo comic which I tackled in episode 47 of Star's Comics and Canon, so go check that out. Then you've got Toonga. Now, Toonga is one of the main characters of the Bounty Hunters run of comics. I've been tackling those in the War of the Bounty Hunters crossover, as well as the Crimson Rain crossover episodes. There's a whole bunch of those, uh, but I did also tackle the first volume of Bounty Hunters by itself before it got intertwined with the War of the Bounty Hunters crossover, and I started that in episode 75 of Comics in Canon, so go and check that out if you want to hear Toonga and also Uris Bynar, who's the other crew member who's there, was also in Bounty Hunters number one, so go check that out. So that's the crew, and they all have comic origins, which is fun, but after Han has kind of recovered from the first punch in the face, he then gets hit by a different punch in the face, by a green hand, and it shows it is Greedo. Greedo is picked up by Kel and her crew, and Kel confirms that they want Han's cut of the reward from the urn, and they demand that Han takes them to the urn. So he takes them to Madeline's shack on Antelion, but the urn is missing, and he blames Ovan, saying it must have taken it. Han confirms that it's not his dad, it can't be his dad, but Han did also put a tracker on him just to check, just in case. Meanwhile, Marshal Buck Vankto finds and stuns Ovan, and then unravels Ovan's con, removing hair, colour, and makeup and things, and it shows it's someone called Corbus Tyra, who has six arrest warrants out for them. It shows that Corbus Tyra seemingly heard about this whole plot and plan with Jabba's urn being worth so much money and decided to go after it. And that's what we saw in the first issue of this. There was one, like a page of someone hearing about a job on Tatooine, but you never see who it is. And that was Corbus Tyra, who was disguising themselves as Han's dad. So Buck Vankto takes Corbus Tyra to the Marshal headquarters. Then shortly afterwards, Cal Tanner's ship then attacks the headquarters and Chewie, Greedo and Uris start firing out while the ship is shooting some of the marshals and things and there's a ground assault and an air assault all going on. It's quite a lot of cool action scenes. And then Chewie throws a thermal detonator which hits Buck Vankto off the roof that he's on. They fortunately manage to grab Corbus and then run into the ship that they just came from. However, on the way there, Buck Vankto shoots Chewie and he collapses. This means that Corbus, Uris and Greedo all get onto the ship, but Chewie doesn't. Kel holds Han at gunpoint and tells him to fly away. They have a bit of a tussle where Han is refusing because he won't leave Chewie behind, and then Greedo comes into the room and shoots Han in the chest. He collapses on the floor with a hole in his chest that is smoking, and then it shows that Chewie, although he was shot, is seemingly okay, but he gets taken to a prison owned by the marshals. He passes Ponda Baba and Cornelius Evazan as he goes in. You'd recognise those as the two unsavoury characters from A New Hope. Uh, Ponda Baba is the Aqualish species, which Obi-Wan cuts his arm off after he kind of harasses Luke a little bit. And Dr. Evazan is, you know, the one who's had some degree of like facial surgery or something and is like, he doesn't like you. I don't like you. You know that guy. Um, he's also, well, the two of them are also make a little cameo appearance in Rogue One as well on Jeddah. Uh, and then Cornelius Evazan also appears in the Doctor. Dr. Aphra story arc called Worse Among Equals. Those are issues 26 to 31 of the 2016 run of Aphra's comic, and I actually tackled that in episode 55 of Comics and Canon, so go check that out if you want to hear about an Everzan story. And then the final panels of this comic show that Chewie is closed in a prison, feeling very sad, but he hears a familiar voice. And who is it? 
is Mars Canata, and that is where it ends. Obviously, Mars Canata yourselves should know uh, because she's the short orange woman who is an alien species of some sort who is over a thousand years old and has the castle on Takodana. She's appeared in little bits in the High Republic, but you would know her from The Force Awakens, which she plays a pivotal role in. She then appears very briefly in Last Jedi and has a couple of scenes uh, in The Rise of Skywalker, but it's primarily uh, The Force Awakens that you get to see her. She also narrates The Forces of Destiny, like animated series, which is meant for like really, really young kids. And as I said, she does appear in other comics and stuff she's one of my favorite characters and i just want more and more content with her the fact that she's older than yoda and she's like over a thousand and still alive and literally witnessed the end of the sith wars and has, it's just it's incredible she's such a cool character and I'd, I'd want to hear more about her but that my friends is the end of han solo and chewbacca volume one the crystal run I will be tackling Volume 2 when it's out, but that's probably not going to be until sort of February, March 2023. So you have plenty of time to pick up those comics. Uh, the first two issues are currently on Marvel Unlimited as of recording this, um, but the remaining ones aren't yet. I know that Marvel Unlimited seems to be like three, four-ish months behind, uh, which I totally understand why they do that, because otherwise, you know, people wouldn't buy the new comics. Uh, but I thought I'd let yourselves know. But what have we got coming up and what else is going on with me? Well, I believe I'm probably going to be tackling the Crimson Rain Volume 4 next week, just because I want to try and get that all wrapped up before Hidden Empire comes out. And I am steadily running out of time because Hidden Empire comes out, I think, October. Uh, And then there's also some issues in between that as well. But um, I'm going to be doing Crimson Rain 4. So that'll be the fourth issue of Crimson Rain, as well as the crossover issues, uh, you know, Darth Vader, Doctor Aphra, Star Wars and Bounty Hunters. So if you haven't already checked out Crimson Rain, uh, please go and do that. You can either type in Crimson Rain Comics in Motion into any podcast app and you'll find it. Or if you're on YouTube, I have a specific playlist for War of the Bounty Hunters and for Crimson Rain. And then once Hidden Empires out, I'll probably just create one playlist with all of them in it to be the big crossover stuff. But that's what's going to happen next week. The week after that, I believe I will be doing the idw publishing clone wars battle tales comic i think that's probably where i'm going to go next then after that i'll do the finale of crimson rain and then the week after that i'm hoping the kenobi the fifth issue of obi-wan kenobi comes out because i can tackle that mini series but if it hasn't done uh, then i would potentially do the ghosts of vader's castle idw anthology horror series because i've done the other two so i'm not sure maybe i'll do that but there is also the midnight horizon book review but i'm still reading midnight horizon Uh, and then i also recently purchased the guardians of the wills manga adaptation uh, which features baz malbus and chirit imwe the two monks from rogue one and it was an adaptation of a book which was meant to be like a prequel to rogue one in some ways just kind of showing what these guardians were actually up to and things Uh, so i'm very excited to read that manga uh, and then give her a review as well as like a walkthrough on this much like i did with the volume one and two of edge of balance but i imagine i'll have to split that in two because it is quite hefty but that is generally everything you can expect from me for the coming weeks obviously the high republic kicks off in a month or two so once that starts to go to full swing that will take up a bit of my time but i imagine that won't start really happening till november december time just because of reading all the books and then the comic arcs and blah 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 Uh, so that's just generally what you can expect but what else have I been involved with recently? Well, I appeared on Spider-Man The Secret Wars to talk about Absolute Carnage and Maximum Carnage, how the two big comic crossover events ran and how they compare to Venom Let There Be Carnage. I also appeared with Megan on Back to the Filmography, talking about the film Collateral. I also appeared with Megan on Femme on Film, talking about Sofia Coppola's Marie Antoinette. And so if you want to hear about any of those things, links are in the description to check out those guest spots. Um, two of them, Back to the Filmography and Femme on Film, they can be found on the feed of Comics in Motion. So if you're listening on a podcast app, it's exactly where you're listening to this episode because that's where I release it. And for my conversation with Spider-Dan, that is on his podcast, Spider-Dan and the Secret Boars. That can be found on a podcast app, much like this show can. It can also be found on YouTube. So, you know, click the links in the description or search for yourself. I think that's the majority of guest spots I've done recently. I did appear on Marvel Plus recently, uh, Brett Scott's show, to talk about She-Hulk episode three, but we're now on episode four of She-Hulk and, you know, those weekly discussion shows, most people don't go back and listen to the old ones uh, because it's quite current and with the time and things. But if you're only up to episode three of She-Hulk as of listening to this or you're going to watch it very soon and you want to hear me talk about it, then you can go check that out too. I have included a link to that in the description. 
But please make sure you go over to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash genuine chit chat. Over there, you've got loads of playlists of my conversations, both on genuine chit chat and Star Wars comics and canon. So there's a Darth Vader playlist, a Dr. Afro playlist. There's playlists about like just bio information. If you just want to find out lots of information about different characters like Darth Maul or Count Dooku or Qui-Gon, things like that. But also on there, there's my Star Wars conversation. So when I spoke with Kevin Scott and Claudia Gray, who are two High Republic authors, as well as when I spoke with Dominic Pace, who's in The Mandalorian, when I spoke with um, Alex and Molly of Star Wars Explained, quite a big YouTube show, or Paolo Villanelli, who is actually a comic book artist who has done the artwork for the majority of the Bounty Hunters comics written by Ethan Sachs. Uh, so they intertwine with the War of the Bounty Hunters, Crimson Rain sort of stuff. So make sure you check those out as well. Obviously, there's my show, Genuine Chit Chat, so check that out. Lots of different conversations on there, some Star Wars, some non-Star Wars related. Then there's also follow me on social media, at Genuine Chit Chat, and on there I post images from some of these comics that I tackle, as well as snippets from my conversations on Genuine Chit Chat, as well as some other stuff I've been up to. On Instagram, on my story, I quite frequently post photos of my puppy and a few vague things that I'm up to and stuff. Uh, so if you want to find out more information about me and you want to just see what I'm generally up to, then Instagram's probably the best way to do it. But on Instagram, Twitter, and on Facebook, I do post the majority of the same content content across them. And obviously the last thing to promote, aside from saying, you know, please rate and review the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, on Good Pods, share on social media, tell your friends about it, those sorts of things. Check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash genuine chit chat. For as little as one pound a month, you get access to hours and hours of additional audio content you can't find anywhere else. I've done Legends book reviews. I've done Canon book reviews. I've not released elsewhere. I've also done reviews of the all the Star Wars movies with my girlfriend, Megan. That's a lot of fun. I've also talked about my life, like we went to a trip to the Isle of Wight we went to Malta uh, we've seen some live performances like Book of Mormon the Great British Bake Off musical Les Miserables so we, whenever we do stuff we basically record and talk about it so following on social media sharing with your friends or supporting on Patreon are all amazing ways to help out this show and Genuine Chit Chat and obviously on Patreon you get loads of additional content early access to stuff and exclusive content too so please consider checking that out as well but that's going to be enough from me, my friends. Thank you so much for listening, as always. I appreciate each and every one of you listening, especially all the way up to the end. And I'll talk to yourselves next week with Crimson Rain number four. So may the force be with you. The intro for Star Wars Comics and Canon is arranged by myself, Mike Burton, and the backing music was made by Eric Matias of soundimage.org. You have just experienced host, creator, everything else are of genuine chit chat and also the host and creator of star wars comics and canon found on the comics in motion podcast mike burton